Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started in just about a minute as we wait for everybody to come in today. Um, so just sit back and relax, and we'll start in just a second. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. My name is Michael Ibrahim. I am the program manager with the cultural investment portfolio at the Mass Cultural Council. Uh, our focus is on grants and services for nonprofit cultural organizations, and we are excited to deliver today's workshop for you today called Risk Assessment Concerns for Nonprofit Boards and Staff During COVID. Uh, this workshop is part of our recover, rebuild, and renew efforts to help organizations come back from COVID-19. Um, this spring, we're offering two free workshops every week in the areas of financial management, legal issues, human resources, advocacy, management, and governance. Um, as Kaylin just mentioned, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat with your name, your organization, and title. Um, joining us today are James Grace and Luke Blackadar from the Arts and Business Council of Greater Boston, along with Christopher Hawthorne from Clarion Insurance and Melissa Sampson McMorrow from Nutter, McLennan, and Fish LLP. Um, while we're going to do introductions in just a minute, just a few ground rules as we go along today. Um, we've got some automatic closed captionings, which I'm actually going to turn on right now. There we go. Um, so we're having some captionings here. Uh, Auto-generated captions are provided on all Mass Cultural Council Zoom meetings and webinars. If you ever need additional accommodations beyond this, like ASL, just let us know when you register for one of our workshops. Um, we're gonna have time for questions and answers throughout the presentation. We ask you to please use the Q&A function and not the chat in order to organize some of our questions to our uh, consultants and panelists. Um, this session is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel afterwards. You will get an email from me when that is ready. Uh, my colleague, Kaylin King is here and Kaylin's gonna be providing some resources in the chat box already. Thank you, Kaylin. Um, and then uh, this presentation and any additional materials that Jim and Luke want to share will be emailed afterwards as well. Uh, we've got a running time of 90 minutes for today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jim. Hello, everybody, and welcome. It's so great to be here with you. And it's been great to, uh, to partner with the Mass Cultural Council and our partners at the VLA uh, for this and the series of workshops that we're working with you on. Um, so when we thought and kind of conceived up this uh, particular <laughs> topic for today, we came up with a general overview. So I just want to review that. And then we have a list of topics next. So we are going to review insurance and risk management process for all organizations. We're going to spend a little extra time in the beginning with Chris to go over kind of almost like an insurance audit or kind of insurance overview. We feel like that's an important way to create a shared language and a create shared understanding kind of where everyone is at. So we will take a couple minutes in the beginning before we jump into the specifics. Um, so, so we hope that is helpful because in some ways this is a topic that merges our business on board program. So we have a program called business on board. We train and place business people on uh, nonprofit cultural boards. We've been doing it for 20 years and our volunteer lawyers for the arts program where direct legal services. And in many ways, these conversations overlap um, and we do get questions from boards and we do get questions from nonprofit executives as well. So this list I think is a kind of a combination of those two programs. We're gonna discuss COVID specific issues that have arisen both in Melissa's practice and in Chris's practice. And then in general, kind of legal risk management concerns that we hear both from boards and from uh, nonprofit executives as well. 
So again, this is kind of a combination of that. So this list right here really, and, and Kaylin's kind of monitoring the chat. So this would be helpful um, as we think about this workshop and then future workshops. Uh, this really is meant to be for us to understand and hear from you. What are some of the questions you're having? And if we can't get to it today, or if it's for another topic, great. We'll, we'll make sure we, um, we make sure we accommodate that going forward. So here's our list in no particular order. So working from home, employee use of personal auto, cybersecurity, volunteers, reopening, subletting, crime, legal duties of directors and officers, personnel management slash human resources, collaborations, mergers, and acquisitions. So as you can tell, this list is long, but it's not exhaustive. And many of these are going to be separate standalone workshops. So we're gonna be putting in the chat different other workshops we're doing with the Mass Cultural Council on similar topics like mergers or, or HR in these areas. So we will go deeper and dive deeper into some of these topics um, as topics as well. And if there's something you came today to talk about or hear about or learn about or resources that's not on this list, please put that in the questions or in the chat and we'll make sure that either we can get to it today or like I said, we'll make sure we note that for um, either additional calls with you or information or backup or future webinars that we're, that we're doing. Okay, um, Chris, do you wanna to go to the next one? All right, so this is where I kind of handed it over to Chris. Chris has been working with us at the Arts and Business Council for oh, about 10 years now. Um, in particular, he's done a lot of work with us for public artists or art in public places. Oftentimes, as we know, that's a place where artists um, are, are for the first time requiring some kind of more in-depth insurance consultation. So Chris has been a great advocate uh, for the arts for many years. He's been a great supporter of, of artists that we worked with. <clears throat> so it's nice to be able to include him in this conversation we find that it's always important to bring in a team approach. So we always have a lawyer on our team. We have an insurance, we have financial. So we, we kind of approach it from this kind of 360 approach. And Chris has been a valuable part, part of that team for many years. So thank you, Chris, for all that support. And I hand it over to you to begin this process, kind of like an overview on insurance and risk. Hey, Jim. Hello again, my name is Chris Hawthorne and I represent Cleary Insurance. And uh, we're out of the Boston, we have an office in the South Shore and the North Shore. And um, we do quite a bit of work with nonprofit organizations. And the things that I'll be presenting uh, today will to some degree be uh, tales from the trail in terms of what we're seeing, uh, in terms of what nonprofits typically do, and uh, also what we see in terms of claims activity. Um, but before we do that, I'd like to start uh, with the overall thinking for an insurance program, if I may. And uh, while this may seem obvious, uh, it gets overlooked quite a bit. Uh, so to provide a, a holistic um, approach for the financial well-being of your organization, your nonprofit, um, we start with the uh, process of identifying or analyzing your exposure. What is it that you have that could be um, lost. And unfortunately, in the insurance world, we jump from what it is we're trying to protect right into insurance policies. And we speak in terms of insurance policies. And so if we can, we'd like to back that up a little bit and realize that typically with insurance, we're talking about um, two things uh, that can happen to you. You, you may, uh, lose financial assets because of something bad happening to your building, to your contents, to your belongings, uh, or you may be found liable for something, some damage that you caused to others. You, you caused uh, bodily injury to others, you caused property damage, or you caused financial loss. And so we always have to keep our eye on the arrow of what direction are we trying to uh, protect and what is it that we are trying to protect? And then we parse it down uh, through policies, which is step two. Once we've identified everything that we're trying to protect, we consider the, the various coverages. And even in the consideration of the coverages, if coverage is not selected, the benefit of considering it is that you're all the more aware of, if you don't have coverage to increase uh, your risk management uh, on, that, on that issue. 
And interestingly enough, step three is risk management. And the purpose of risk management is to simply put, reduce the odds of a loss from occurring uh, and or once a loss has occurred, reduce the size of the loss. So if you have drivers and you wanna reduce the odds of loss, you would check that they have good driving records or you would have a rule that you can't drink and drive. And that would greatly reduce the odds of the loss. To reduce the size of the loss once it's happened, you would give your drivers instructions on what to do following a loss. Um, and I won't delve into that, but that's an example of how risk management can help your uh, loss exposure go down. And when your loss exposure goes down, uh, so do your premiums. Uh, and then next we implement the coverage and the risk management, uh, and then you review periodically. And then this, and which typically means once a year, especially if we have a board in play. Um, and then within that realm is just knowing some of the basic rules of insurance. And the first one, uh, and I apologize for being so crass, but first one to realize is that unlike the commercials we see on TV, insurance carriers are not good neighbors. They're not good hands. Their job is to get your money and keep it. And in exchange for that, the policies make a few promises. And that's what we together uh, as a team do is to design, uh, making sure that those promises match up to cover your loss exposures. But just always keep in mind that an insurance carrier does not want to pay a claim. And so therefore we need to make sure that we always have all the facts uh, on the table and that after a loss, they will do the right thing legally, which is anything they can do to not pay the claim. And we want to design a system, well thought out system where they have to pay the claim. Um, another rule, and these are just my rules, um, but another rule is other than the law or what a lender or a business partner requires of you, there's no right or wrong. And so if your organization has a certain risk tolerance and you can live with not doing this or not doing that, as long as you're willing to understand the price tag of that, um, perfectly um, acceptable. Uh, insurance is pretty unforgiving. Uh, these policies are name and location specific. So suffice it to say, suffice it to say, if you do go through the trouble to design your program and get a tailor fit to your organization, if something changes in your organization, such as you open up a new location or you change where your office is, or you change an activity, it's a good bet that you want to make a phone call and include your insurance partner so they can make adjustments in real time, preferably before the change is made. Um, Another one that uh, is kind of arduous, but critical, and that is when the insurance people send you something in writing, read it. Um, very often there's teeth in that correspondence. And the smaller your organization, the more you might be on your own to decipher what's being sent to you. And once the insurance company has sent something to you, they've kind of checked the box. Um, they they typically don't have a responsibility to follow up to make sure you read it. So words of the wise, and if you read something and you don't understand it, that's, you should be um, reaching out to your broker. The broker is getting paid to service you and ask for um, an education. And then um, as I'm guessing Melissa will attest to that once a loss happens, we are all out of control. The insurance carrier doesn't get to decide what happens. The, the plaintiff doesn't get to decide. You don't get to decide. A jury or a judge does. So once it goes into the legal system, who knows where a loss is going to go? And it can take years. So it's, all, it's in everyone's best interest to avoid and reduce losses to the degree possible. And then the final one is that an insurance program is only good is the time you put into it. So let's jump into what that might look like. So for any organization, nonprofit or otherwise, you will typically find these three, and excuse me for one sec, 
as questions appear, if you would like to um, uh, let me know what they are, I'm happy to answer as we go, uh, as to not lose context. Um, so these policies are the package of policy, the auto policy, workers comp, and the umbrella policy. These are kind of the cornerstone of any organization's insurance program. The package policy is a combination of two main coverages. Uh, the first is your property. The things that you have at your location or within a hundred feet of your location. Um, so your desks, your computers, uh, any kind of promotional uh, inventory you have, flyers, pamphlets, um, tangibles uh, would be covered under your property coverage uh, for your organization. And then it is connected to general liability. And when it comes to commercial insurance, please understand that anytime you see the word liability, there needs to be a descriptive word before it. And with general liability, that means bodily injury and property damage to others. So in the package policy on one column we have, we're covering your quote unquote stuff on site at that location or any location listed on the policy. And we're also covering for any bodily injury or property damage that your organization causes others, excluding certain activities such as use of an auto. So therefore we need to have an auto policy. And typically, or often we see nonprofits not owning vehicles. And so there is a coverage called non-owned and hired auto. And we attach that to the general liability policy. And should your organization be named in a claim having to do with use of an auto, say the executive director is on their way home from a fundraiser and hits and injures someone, the executive director, the owner of the vehicle, probably one and the same, but also because the executive director was on the business of the nonprofit, um, the nonprofit may become a defendant. And so how do we do that? We do that through non-owned and hired auto. Um, then we have workers' compensation. If you have employees, not volunteers, but if you have employees in Massachusetts, the, the law requires that one must have uh, an organization must have workers comp and the workers comp coverage covers you for the statutory laws of the state you're in as, as well as lost wages and medical bills and the statutory coverages are a uh, chart of various types of industries injuries that for that type of injury you get x amount of an award as an injured uh, employees such as loss of a hand, loss of a foot, loss of eyesight, loss of speech, and they all have different amounts. Employers liability is when, again, liability, the descriptive word employers, employers liability is for when you have an employee that's injured and they sue for benefits, and then the family sues because the family life has been disrupted. So the spouse is no longer able to play catch or um, earn a living to uh, help support education. So the family may sue uh, through the employer's liability and that's packaged together under the workers' compensation policy. So as you can see, these three underlying policies have a facet of liability function. One is the bodily injury and property damage under the general, the bodily injury and property damage under the auto, and then the employer's liability to the family under the workers' comp. That's called the primary level of coverage that every organization will typically have. And often organizations are not comfortable with the level of coverage, the amount of coverage that that provides. They, they may feel that they want a higher degree or a higher amount of coverage than the basic provides. So what 
the organization will do is purchase what's known as an excess or an umbrella policy. And that one policy will stand behind or stand over the three underlying policies. And that way, if the liability, say you have a million dollar auto limit and it's a $2 million claim, the umbrella will back up that claim. So this is the cornerstone of any organization, any commercial organization, profit or nonprofit. Then if we go to nonprofit, first we start with uh, directors and officers. And very often when people think of directors and officers, they start thinking of banks. But the plain language uh, definition of a directors and officers policy is wrongful management. Did your organization get managed in such a way that it caused someone harm, typically financially? And the people that can sue under a DNO policy, who can sue your organization under a DNO policy, include your employees, uh, the general community. Uh, uh, not this is not really pertinent, but competitors, the government. Um, so many people can come after an organization for wrongful management, and um, I believe both Melissa and I are recommending a guide from the attorney general on um, that he, that you can hand out to your board annually on the responsibilities of a nonprofit board member. Uh, that would be a risk management tool to help you with uh, the concept of making sure that your wrongful management exposure is reduced by having board members follow their responsibilities. In this day and age, the next uh, for any organization, certainly, certainly for nonprofits, is the issue of cyber. Cyber used to mean the stealing of credit cards and personal information to then be sold on the market. About two years ago, the cyber criminals decided that, you know, it's just easier to steal your money. And so how do they do that? Two ways. One is they have a uh, roving ransomware malware uh, that just typically travels the earth looking for open doors. And if your system is not secure, um, you may get malware into your computers and one day you come in and your screens have a message on it saying that if you would like your operations back, you need to pay X amount of Bitcoin. The next way, and we're seeing this more and more, and that is that the criminal gets into your computer and they wait and they watch. And they, so in the case of a nonprofit, they may see that a large grant is coming your way. And they then will just wait and wait. And just at the right moment, when that money's released to your organization, it disappears because the criminal uh, residing inside your computer, picture somebody as a train's coming down the track, somebody pulls the lever and suddenly the train goes off to the right. Well, that train is your money or the, 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 uh, the grant. So every organization uh, would be wise to have a uh, cyber insurance policy. Then if your organization has employees, just like workers comp will protect your, your organization for bodily injury damage to the employees. What if you, what if your organization somehow um, steps on or breaks uh, a local state or federal employment law? And this day and age that is getting easier and easier to do. You picture that, um, you hire two new employees and you walk into your lobby one day and one employee is wearing a Magda hat and the other employee is wearing a Black Lives Matter hat. And they have the right to express themselves, but you as the employer know we got a problem. And how do we navigate that? And what if somebody tries to hold us accountable because we made a mistake? So what we're seeing increasingly is as society, um, continues to change, uh, 
the employees can find themselves in a tough spot. So if you have employees, uh, employment practices is a, uh, a good idea. The other thing it can do, not only will it protect you from uh, uh, charges of harassment, discrimination, wrongful hiring, wrongful firing, it can also cover you if one of your employees is harassing a third party. And so for the nonprofits that are working hand in hand with other organizations, um, we see those claims come across the transom uh, and employment practices is there to, um, to work for that. Chris, um, I had a question on, on this. One of the things that I think I'm starting to see more of is members of boards being accused of certain employment violations if you've got a very action, you know, hands-on board, how would you recommend that a that an organization provide coverage for that situation? Is that under this policy or is that is that elsewhere? That's a great question, Melissa. Um, so the answer to that is that the um, where you can find your solution is in the definition of who is an insured. Mm. And what we would want to do is make sure that a board member was covered under the definition of an insured under the employment practices. Now, years ago, one found their employment practices liability tucked inside their directors and officers yep. policies. Yep. That is your parents' Oldsmobile, so to speak. <laughs> uh, that ship has sailed and uh, for the most part, uh, employment practices is now sold as a very often from the same carrier, but very often sold as a separate policy. Um, and interestingly enough, when you get it from the same carrier, very often you can buy a million dollars of coverage for your directors and officers and share that million with your employment practices liability. Um, and so therefore you've got a million dollars to cover both uh, exposures. It's a dangerous game though, because if a claim comes in on one, then you've lost your limitation on the other exposure. But okay. uh, depending on cash flow, sometimes it's better than not having. But mm -hmm. to answer the question again, if we wanna make sure somebody's covered for a particular act, we look inside the policy under the definition of who's an insured. Okay. And we do that before we buy the policy. <laughs> <laughs> so once the policy's purchased, that can be tough to change at least for that year. The next policy that um, I suggest that every nonprofit have, and amazingly, very few do, is crime. Um, and that is for employee dishonesty. Somebody inside the organization or outside steals money. And uh, especially with nonprofits where you're dealing with the use of other people's money. I think a crime policy would be quite wise in terms of your reputational um, well-being. In if somebody's given you a large grant and that money's stolen and there's nothing to replenish the money, I think that could leave people in a um, bad disposition and also consider the thought of, hey, was there wrongful management? And if there was wrong, if, so if I've given a million dollars to an organization and got stolen, I might be upset enough to go to a wrongful management stage. And one thing that I did not mention with directors and officers uh, coverage is it, it becomes far more interesting when you realize that when a director or officer is sued, they're sued as an individual, mm -hmm. uh, not, not as the entity, as, as the individual. And so the entity is supposed to, um, uh, is supposed to reach out and protect uh, the individual, but if, if the entity is not able to, the individual stands alone in that, um, in that suit. So crime coverage, uh, it's not expensive. And I would suggest that it's a one-on-one coverage of any nonprofit. And, and you hit on it, Chris, the, the financial crimes are, you, you, you see, it's not uncommon to see the financial crimes. It isn't, and they yeah. usually are quite large. Um, and they can go on for years. So um, while we're on this topic, if I may, 
Uh, one thing to note about a crime policy is that very often a crime policy gives the organization a certain number of days when a employee leads to audit to make sure that there has not been a crime committed. So if your CEO or your CFO or COO leaves, that's the time to look to make sure that everything is tight because after, in some cases, 60 days, um, the crime cover, if you discover the crime two years later, the crime policy won't respond. They wanna be on the scene immediately. Uh, so that requires some uh, elbow grease on the organization's part. Um, and one of the reasons that we see crime policies happening so um, not so frequently, but as often as they do, is that very often the operational side of a nonprofit, um, you have a few people wearing a lot of hats and, and maybe not with real tight supervision. Uh, and so it's pretty easy to cover up uh, the disappearance of money uh, at least for a while. Uh, the next coverage is fiduciary. And if your plan, if your um, organization has a retirement plan or a group health plan, somebody in the organization is quote unquote, a fiduciary. And um, if somebody is unhappy with the results of the benefits or the retirement, the 403B, um, they can go after the fiduciary. And once again, when you go after fiduciary, you're going after that person as an individual. Um, often we hear organizations say, well, we work with XYZ investment, Fidelity, whomever, and they serve as the fiduciary. And I would caution organizations to rethink that. Very often in the agreements that one would have with those large organizations, they actually have the organization hold the financial institution harmless for any fiduciary activities. And so it's, um, it's very important that if you do have a health plan uh, or a uh, benefit plan that fiduciary coverage uh, be in place. And then if you have volunteers um, and not so much in the past 12 months, but hopefully going forward, if you're out doing fundraisers, very often we have volunteers and volunteers can get injured. Um, and when a volunteer is injured, it does not fall under the worker's comp. It has to be a paid person for it to be worker's comp. So uh, we didn't think so much about this years ago when people had a health insurance plan with a $5 copay. And if somebody got hurt, it wasn't that, you know, they, they got a scrape or they broke an ankle or a wrist. They went to the hospital and they had a small copay. Today, we're seeing uh, people with 2,000 individual, 3,000 individual deductibles and then big copays uh, where they really can be put in harm's way financially if, um, if they have to use the medical system. And so uh, we'll get to this a little bit later, but uh, with a nonprofit that has volunteers, it's nice to see a volunteer program. And then for certain nonprofits, errors and omissions. And that's for a mistake you make in the, or, or something you fail to do in your performance of the organization's uh, role, uh, such as if you are a, religious organization and you do some uh, pastoral counseling, um, or if you're a homeless shelter and you have some counseling, um, the, there could be, and I suppose if it's a nonprofit giving uh, advice to public artists and the nonprofit fails to make them aware of something that the artist could say, well, I had a reasonable expectation to have been taught that, that, that could be an error of some omissions. And um, several of the carriers that specialize in nonprofit coverage uh, will very often include errors and omissions uh, automatically. And then if you do have employees, there's the issue of the benefits basics are group health, group dental, group life, and group disability. And Group life and disability are 
quite inexpensive. Uh, group dental really is an insurance. It's just kind of a prepaid benefit. And if it's a very healthy, financially healthy organization, uh, group dental is nice for retention of employees. Um, and then group health is the one that uh, stops the clock with the price these days. So um, did that. So a, a mature nonprofit insurance program would look something like the screen in front of you. Are there any questions at this time? No? Not yet. Okay, so specifically, now we're going to jump into issues arising out of um, the COVID uh, situation that we find ourselves in. So one of the things, so behind me, you see a uh, picture of the Potomac River um, as taken from a room in the Watergate Hotel. And that is because I'm working from home. And um, the and I'm sure I can hear everybody saying he's an insurance guy. He's a crook. So that's why I have the Watergate picture up there. And I hope some people are old enough to get that. Um, the um, so we have employees working from home, and uh, what could that mean to your organization? Um, well, first off, you may have some of your property at your employees. Uh, homes. And as we said in the slide a few minutes ago, your, the nonprofit's property is covered at the described location in the policy or within 100 feet of it. And as we said in the very first slide, insurance policies are very name and location specific. So let's say that you have some expensive equipment. Say um, you've moved a very expensive printer uh, to somebody's home, or let's say you've moved a lot of your promotional inventory to somebody's home. Once it goes 100 feet from the described premises on the policy, there's no more coverage. So what do we do? We can consider adding the employee's home location to the property, the package policy, or we can purchase another coverage called Inland Marine. And in the marine coverage is for property that goes off site. And it's very flexible, very inexpensive. Um, and that would be how I would do it rather than adding an employee's home location. So please note that you will get no protection from the employee's, um, uh, from the employee's homeowner's policy. So, so if you do have things off site now, if many of you have an employee taking a computer home or a laptop home, you may not worry, you may not wish to worry about this in that typically on a commercial property policy, the property deductible in any loss is at least a thousand dollars. And in today's world, um, laptops typically aren't getting much above that. So uh, that may just be an out of pocket expense. Uh, but Again, if you do have things that are of value going off your location, uh, consider in the Marine or adding the uh, employee's location to your package policy. Chris, is there a cost to adding somebody to, for the first bullet there, adding the employee's home to the policy? Are there like additional fees associated with these suggestions? Yes. So when you add, when you add the location, for the most part, no. But when you add the property coverage, yes. And it would be the same as if you added the property coverage at the office. So if you have $10,000 worth of property coverage at the office, and now you're adding $4,000 at 1313 Mockingbird Lane, you could expect 40% of that property premium. On the other hand, you may be decreasing the coverage at the office, and therefore there'd be an offsetting credit. Right. So... Okay. Um, Chris, there is a question here um, in the group. So it says, what if someone is working for a nonprofit but receives a stipend rather than a salary? Would this offsite coverage cover this person? And that could really be for either Chris or Melissa, really. Um, if they're receiving a stipend. Uh, the question, I guess, would be have to be to the person 
when you say stipend, is it through like a 1099 or a salary census? So I'm, I'm guessing by the way it's worded that it's you're, the person is not an employee. Well, right? <laughs> or, or it depends on how that, I, I guess it's something, it, you almost would, may need to know more about how that money is being, is it being sent as an employee or is it being sent as a 1099? So in short, um, and he, the, here comes exactly. the uh, bouncing tennis ball. Um, in short, when you pay somebody to do something for you, at least in Massachusetts, they very well may be, even though you don't want them to be, they very well may be able to claim employee status, even if it's only for two hours a week. Um, so if, if, if you're paying them as a 1099 and or a stipend uh, and they do not carry workers' comp coverage and they get hurt, they can certainly file for benefits your workers' comp carrier will deny it, saying they're not an employee, and then the injured party's attorney will file a suit. And 99 times out of 100, uh, the Department of Industrial Accidents will grant the workers' comp coverage to the injured party. Uh, so the minute you start, in, even if you have a written agreement saying you're an independent contractor, uh, that is a that can be a very tough thing to defend. Uh, from a worker's comp point of view. In terms of paying a stipend and having them work from home, um, the property is location driven, not employee driven. So if your property is at 10 Smith Street, Marblehead, Mass, we need to make sure that 10 Smith Street is a covered location. It's yeah, not. Go, go ahead. ahead, sorry. I was just going to underscore the the piece about it's really hard to not be an employee and no matter what you call the form of payment and no matter what you mutually agree on how to report it it's, it's just really hard and you have a lot of people judging after the fact the workers comp bureau the irs um, and so an employment lawyer to make sure everything is structured right or an hr specialist is a really good idea um, and, and we can cover more you, of this. I mean, just to be just to go deeper, this is also going to be part of Luke's conversation yeah. with his consultants on the on the on the on the workshop specific to HR as well. So it's a great question and it comes up all the time in, in so many different contexts. I think that's what makes it so complex. So uh, so the rule that we follow in the in Massachusetts insurance is we follow uh, chapter 149. And uh, it starts off with a clause in the law that says this law supersedes all of the laws. Now, whether it does or not, who knows, but that's up to the judge and jury, but it's a heck of a way to start a law. And uh, it's got a three-part test. And it's pretty hard to, um, it's, it, it's pretty hard to get past that. And even if you do, a non-insured subcontractor can almost always find a way to get coverage under the workers' comp. And again, risk management states that we want to do everything we can to prevent loss from hitting your insurance policies. Um, and so there are things that one can do with independent contractors ahead of time to make sure that this doesn't happen to your organization. That could be a um, topic for a whole nother presentation. Um, okay, did that help? All right. In terms of um, now we have an employee working in their home and a homeowner's policy or a renter's policy or a condominium owner's policy, they have something in common. And that is under the liability section of the policy, it says we will not provide any coverage for any commercial activity and um, nonprofit work <laughs> would indeed be considered uh, commercial under a homeowner's quote unquote policy. And so now we've got the person working and I'll paint the following scenario. Um, you have a UPS person now coming to your home on a frequent basis and the UPS person slips under your stairs, shatters their shoulder. The UPS workers comp carrier will put that person back together 
but then want to know why did we have to spend all that money putting Susan Smith shoulder back together? Oh, well, um, she slipped on Julie Davis's stairs and it was icy. So, oh, so the, that workers comp carrier will knock on the door of Julie's homeowners and say, we want to be reimbursed because of the slip and fall. Now, typically if a UPS driver was injured, the homeowners would respond to that injury, to that bodily injury. However, once they get deeper into the claim, they find out that it wasn't for Julie's uh, delivery at all. It was for her employer. And therefore the homeowner's policy can then, believe it or not, deny the claim. So what do we do about that? Um, we have something called, in the industry, there's something called permitted incidental occupancy. And I would suggest that if you have any employees working from home in writing once a year, you suggest, and maybe your annual letter, um, you suggest that if you work from home, you may wish to talk to, you should talk to your personal insurance agent about whether or not you need permitted incidental occupancy. I would not tell them to get it or not to get it. Leave it between their agent and the employee. Um, and if an agent tells them they don't need it, then that, and, and it turns out they do, then that will be on the agent's errors and omissions coverage. Um, it's a very inexpensive addition to a homeowner's policy. And it would then cover for lossing arising out of commercial activity. It's not gonna cover the nonprofit. It's just gonna cover the homeowner for something that quirky that happened liability wise. Um, based on the business activity. Chris, can you give a sense of, you say it's hard sometimes, it's very inexpensive. Can you put a dollar amount to some of these kind of quotes? I think it's helpful for people to, to have a sense of the actual range that it might be. And then the second part of that question would be, let's say it is you know $50 additionally a year. Is that also something if we think about the cost from the nonprofit or from the employer's perspective, let's say I'm an ED and I wanna make sure that there's extra costs associated with people working from home. Um, and maybe this is a, a, um, a Melissa question too. Can we start to add up these costs and think about how we can um, almost kind of make them whole in a sense? Cause we are saving money when our employees are not working in the office to some extent too, right? So as we think about these costs, so I guess it's a two part question. So the Typical price tag for permitted incidental occupancy will range from approximately $35 to maybe 80 a year. And would it be uh, within reason for the, um, the nonprofit to reimburse the employee? I would think, of course. Now, if the employee in a different time, non-COVID, had requested to work from home, I think that changes the perspective but where we're saying you have to work from home or you should work right. from home then i think that's a reasonable thing for the nonprofit to do yeah well especially now we're going to go into a hybrid situation where folks are many folks may not ever come back full-time in a sense of the office right so this kind of um post-covid um you know workspace you know that's why i'm thinking that there's probably some hybrid issues that will evolve over the next three to five years you know so key point here though is get it in writing that you shared this so okay so many things happen where no one thought about it and then once it happens people have assumptions that always favor their position <laughs> and very often it doesn't work out that way so communications before a loss can save a lot of heartache um then along with our um issue of the employee being uh, outside of the domain of the office. Now, so is the computer. And the computer is now operating, the employee's computer is now operating through that home's um, software and modem and um, all those systems. And who knows what the security is. And once the criminal gets into one work computer, you can assume that all your computers are infected. Um, so we're going to recommend a, uh, a security, uh, consultant in a few minutes. Uh, but a questionnaire would be, uh, typically from your security consultant. What is it that you expect people 
to do? Are they working from their own computer? Are they working from your computer? Should they be on a virtual private network? The answer is different for every organization, but the questions are very wise to get to ask and to get answered and then to address uh, because Again, this is a foreseeable loss. It's a given that this is coming. And the, cyber, the pandemic was a gift to cyber criminals. So I'll leave that at that. Um, here's one that uh, can really slip through the cracks. Very often, nonprofits will have their workers comp through their payroll company. And I am a big um, critic of that move. It's convenient, but the payroll company is not an insurance agent and their, their sensitivities and what they're looking out for isn't from this risk management, uh, exposure protection, financial well-being point of view as your insurance uh, advisor should be. And here's one place where uh, amazingly it gets lost in the weeds all the time. So if we have a nonprofit say located in Newburyport and um, I'm making this up, but I'll call it Newburyport's Arts Festival. I'm sure one exists, but, um, and they have a beautiful location in downtown Newburyport, but now no one's there. And suddenly we have some people working from uh, Southern New Hampshire. Well, the workers comp policy, remember we talked about statutory coverage? Every state has a different set of statutory coverages and that's called coverage A. Um, and if you have a Massachusetts workers comp policy and you haven't endorsed it to add New Hampshire to coverage A, two things happen. One is, that New Hampshire has different coverages, usually double what Massachusetts coverages are. And therefore your organization might be on the hook for the difference. Or depending on your workers comp carrier, they may not pay the claim at all because you don't have New Hampshire listed. And now that you have an employee working out of New Hampshire at their home, um, we were in that trap. The second thing that can happen is Let's say that the employee working from home is injured while doing the work. Let's go back to the UPS. The UPS truck arrives, the package comes in, the employee gets out a razor blade to open the package and then really lacerates themselves to the point where they have to go to the emergency room. The first thing they will ask you in an emergency room, is this injury related to your auto or to your, auto, to your automobile or to work. And if the employee says, well, yeah, I was doing work, um, then uh, that eventually will be reviewed by the Department of Labor in New Hampshire. They will then probably six to seven months later, send you a letter saying, dear Newburyport Festival, we noticed that there was an injury in, um, you know, 10 Smith Street, uh, Dover, New Hampshire. Uh, can you send us, or please send us a copy of your workers' comp policy, evidence, cover J for New Hampshire. And if you can't, uh, attached is the amount you owe the state of New Hampshire, which is $2,500 for the baseline, and then $100 a day that your person's been in New Hampshire with no coverage A. So this is a nasty little trigger that they actually, uh, New Hampshire plays very well. They, so does Rhode Island. Uh, it's a real moneymaker. And uh, so if you have your people working from home, we need to update your workers' comp. Now your employees during COVID or even not during COVID, uh, maybe using their personal autos, uh, so again, with your annual correspondence to your employee, we wanna tell them that uh, when you're driving your vehicle, you're responsible for any damage to your vehicle and any liability rising out of that vehicle. The organization is not here. The organization is not protected. That comes from your personal auto insurance. 
So even if you go to Staples to get some supplies and a car next to you opens the door and puts a big dent in your car, that is not going to be handled through the auto policy of the nonprofit. And again, no one thinks about it until after it happens. And then we have bad feelings um, and maybe sometimes pretty angry ones too. Um, so therefore communication can really help. At the same time, we need to say to the employee, if you're using your auto for business purposes, you should talk to your insurance agent and consider adding something called business class 30, which tells the personal insurance policy that, yep, this vehicle gets used in business pursuits. So as an insurance broker, uh, a year ago, I used to go from client to client's office during the day. That's a business pursuit. My wife is a social worker. Would she answer that she uses her vehicle in business? Probably not, but she does. So the answer is yes. Anything, picture the factory worker that goes in at eight and comes out at four and goes home. That's not business use, but anything else basically is. And so therefore the conversation should be had with the, uh, ins the person's insurance broker. And again, we want to double down on the fact that we want to make sure that you have it in writing to all your employees on hire and annually that you advise them of this. Uh, Chris, can we go back to cost on that? I'm sorry. This is class 30. Again, we'll run um, 35 to 60 or $70. So, and there's different carriers handle it in different ways. Um, some insurance, personal insurance says, if you have business class, business class 30 on the policy, all vehicles have it. Other uh, policies only listed for a specific vehicle. And so if you're a person that maybe jumps from car to car, um, you, you, <laughs> you might wanna have that as a consideration in who you select as your auto carrier. So, and, and for those of you who might be calling your broker to discuss, if somebody tells you, they, if the broker tells you you do not need that coverage, ask them to, uh, anytime a broker tells you you don't need the coverage, ask them to send it to you in writing. On the issue of cybersecurity, again, if you do not have a cyber policy, I would suggest uh, that is something that you would want to do immediately. Um, for a nonprofit, I think you're typically going to see the cyber premium run around $1,000 a year for a million dollars worth of coverage. Um, there, are, um, there are many cyber forms. There's no standard cyber form in place to date, unlike general liability or workers' comp. And uh, one carrier that uh, I would suggest is a great place to start is a carrier called BCS. And um, they, they're quite sophisticated for their premium. Another carrier that I would trust is a carrier called Evolve. A um, little bit more expensive. Uh, both of those carriers are, again, for the money, uh, pretty, uh, pretty rich in coverage. Um, but you definitely want to work with somebody that knows what cyber is and there's many facets to it this first party which is money that comes out of your budget uh such as ransomware forensics when something bad happens and you got to hire techs to come in and figure out what happened and then you got to rebuild your system then this third party when other people hold you uh accountable for the damage done to them and also including governmental fines uh so uh and then the other thing we want to do in a cyber policy, especially when we have people working off site, is review uh, what computer equipment is covered and who is there any requirement for who owns the computer equipment. Um, cyber policies, again, there's, there's about 80 of them now, and every single one of them is different. Some of them are on a reimbursement basis where if something bad happens to you, you have to lay out the money and then you get reimbursed. Well, if that's 30,000 in ransomware and you've got to go without that $30,000 for a couple of months while the claim gets processed, you may not want that. You may want one where um, 
the the policy has to step up and pay up front for you. Uh, the other thing to know with cyber is if something, if you do have cyber coverage and you do have a cyber event, do not handle it yourself and then turn the claim in. You have to include the cyber company right out of the gate. The other thing in getting to the next point is please don't go this alone. If you have a Massachusetts resident or a New Hampshire resident or a Rhode Island resident, you fall under the laws of those states for what you're required to do to protect their privacy. And in Massachusetts, you have to write a written, if you have a Massachusetts employee, you have to write a written information security protocol. And it's, those are not all that, you can write one that's meaningless, uh, but again, when we end up in front of that jury, or well, we're talking about wrongful management, we want to make sure we did a good job. So we want to hire not a tech person, but a security person. The tech person puts computers together and makes them work. A security person, picture this, the tech person builds the house. Uh, the security person is the locksmith. And while they both have a lot of the same knowledge, actually different sciences. Um, and then not only do we want to write a written information security plan that says we've analyzed our loss exposure, we know where our information and our data is and how we're going to protect it. What if something happens? In that case, we need a recovery plan. And that is how are you going to recover from this and get out of this? And remember the concept with risk management, reduce the size of the loss once it occurs. Nowhere is it more important than having a recovery plan from a cyber event. Keep in mind, when you have a cyber event, the tool that you use for almost everything in terms of research and communication is gone. So you, you will literally be down to the three ring binder, flipping open the first page saying, okay, what do we do first? So having a professionally written recovery plan is brilliant. And in that recovery plan, I would suggest that you discuss with your attorney that the person who will coordinate the recovery of the cyber event would in fact be your attorney. Because if, depending on what happens, there may be people trying to hold you accountable. And if your attorney is doing the work for you, you may, from what I understand, and I cannot give legal advice, but from what I understand, you may actually have attorney client privilege protection if you have the attorney doing the communicating with the government uh, doing the communicating with the lenders, uh, with the donors, with the foundations. Um, Melissa, would you agree? There are mechanisms that you can put in place to establish privilege. Um, I, I am going to confess, uh, I am not a cybersecurity expert, but we, I, my partner, Seth Berman, uh, you know, is definitely been seeing these things and, um, I do believe that 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 um, that that that's correct, but I would you know I would be happy to confirm that with anyone. And nonprofit does not mean non money, and so absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. So this is this is job one in today's world, especially with the pandemic. Chris, can you um, say the other name? There's a quick question in the. Um, in the chat, question answer. The second cover, the second company was BCS, and was it Evolve? Was Evolve. the second one that Evolve? Yep. Evolve. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a broader question in the Q and A, which is, which you, I'll, I'll ask it, and then you might wait until maybe this section is done. But it's a broader question around um, a kind of benchmarking, reviewing your current insurance policy slash coverage. You know, is there a benchmark for using? Um, you know, the same insurance company or potentially switching. So that might be a question for kind of when we're done, more like hiring and then managing your insurance agent or broker might be a, a good question uh, either now, if you want to do it now or at the end of this section. Well, so that's a pretty straightforward question. And that is um, when you obtain insurance, um, do you obtain it piecemeal and worry about the, you, you put it out to bid um, and then um, pretty much go for the most quote, the term we use is competitive price um, or the better way to purchase your insurance in my opinion is 
to interview brokers or agents and talk to them about what their philosophy is and how they would be a partner in managing your insurance and risk management program. And we go back to that very first slide about ID and analyze, consider coverages, uh, implement, and what risk management tools should we use? And in terms of benchmarking, benchmarking is a bit of a red herring in that um, every organization has slightly different uh, risk tolerance. And uh, so if you're working with an appropriate broker um, that can get things in the uh, right language to associate. So if we're working with a board of directors that's got 20 members, all of whom are quite wealthy uh, and the organization has heavy assets, we may want to have bigger limits. Um, and, uh, and if we're not gonna have bigger limits, then we may wanna communicate with the board members uh, that we're not gonna be carrying very rich limits. Board members are incredibly trusting people um, and very often find there's tail under the rocking chair too late. Uh, so the, the benchmarking really is in that initial process of the ID and analysis and the coverage selection um, and putting together a holistic overview of what your program is and is not covering. Are you doing an annual review? Are you spending equal time on the coverages that you do not have as opposed to the pricing of your current coverage? Um, so it's a, uh, I, I hope that helps. Um, that there's not, I'm sure we can find a benchmark that says if you have 10 million in assets, you should have this, 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 and this. Um, but I find that to be not all that helpful. And you need a little bit more it needs to be in more context and more personalized to each organization. Yeah, and I would agree. I mean, that's a question that Luke and I, I'm sure most gets all the time, you know, send us a standard contract for something when the reality is there is oftentimes no such thing. And the more it's tailored, not just to your wants, but to your needs as well. I mean, I think that's where the true kind of partnership, both with your legal support and with your accountants and your, and your insurance professionals and, you know, kind of that team approach is really, um, I agree, the more it's, customized against your risk and your needs and your culture and your values, then you're probably going to get a better, a better match. And Jim, you just brought up a great point that I'm kicking myself and not putting into the presentation. When we do a risk analysis or we do a, uh, a loss exposure, one of the things along with reviewing, you know, what's the building worth? What are your contents worth? What do you, we also have to, not as lawyers, but as insurance brokers, we have to analyze your contracts. What have you committed to to others? If you're working with the, um, if you're working with the PBD Essex Museum in Salem, they may have a set of requirements that your policy has to match, or the Museum of Fine Arts, or uh, Boston College is have, you're doing something there, but the you know the, the city of Boston, and you could be financially damaged by having an insurance program that you find out after the fact does not live up to the contractual requirements that your organization agreed to. Yeah, so, and I think also this would be an important time to point out, you know, groups that are going through DEIA analysis and they're really breaking down and deconstructing their organization. This is also an equity question, as well as we think about your contracts and your culture and, and how this plays out in your programs, whether it be benefits or uh, the agreements you have with your employees or everything. So this is part of that larger um, also can be part of that larger conversation too. So I just want to kind of rise that up a little bit too. And a word to the wise um, for any organization, and that is you should have a relationship with your insurance provider, your insurance advisor, that where you consult them before you make a decision and take action. If you take action and put something into play and then the insurance advisor finds out about it, very often there's little they can do other than go out and maybe find an expensive solution or maybe not. Um, whereas very often things can be handled and manipulated or massaged in a way that everybody's happy and it doesn't have a, a big hit to the organization. Back on volunteers, um, a volunteer accident program usually costs about $300 a year. Uh, 
and it, you that will usually give you ten thousand dollars per um, damage or injury to a volunteer. And then again, not to give legal advice, but I would certainly talk to your legal advisor about having volunteers sign waivers where they hold harmless indemnify the organization for any injuries they sustain while volunteering for your organization. Um, for directors and officers, uh, pure and simple. If you do not have DNO um, as, a, as a nonprofit, I would, I would certainly get it. And um, the, I would look at the, we have policies for, when I say we, the industry has policies you can very often bundle your directors and officers, your employment practices, your fiduciary and your crime coverage um, on one program and you can share limits and save some money doing that or you can get standalone policies. Uh, and then in looking at a DNO policy, we also wanna make sure that we know <laughs> what it's covering and, uh, and that we have, these policies are full of definitions and we wanna make sure that what's a wrongful act, uh, what the retroactive date is. If you're switching DNO policies, you also want to look at, again, something called the retroactive date. And if somebody presents a DNO policy that's far cheaper than the one you're currently carrying, it could be that they're sliding this term called the retro date, which is when coverage began. So if your organization began in 1980 and suddenly you're changing your carrier, they may slide the retro date to 2021, which means you've now lost coverage for any actions taken between 1980 and 2021. So there's ways to do it safely. You just need to be aware that that is a, uh, an issue to be careful of. Um, in terms of being an employer, uh, a long, organizations historically had an attorney, an accountant, and an insurance person. I would say that today's uh, organization should also have a security consultant and an HR consultant. The days of having the specific HR person seem to be long gone. Um, and so having an HR consultant that you meet with annually to make sure that you're dotting your I's and crossing your T's and uh, doing things properly is a, is a very good idea, along with having the employment practices insurance protection. And Chris, just to have a tenth of time, so we have 15 minutes left based on our scheduled time. And we also want to obviously give Melissa some time at the end for her, her slides too. So I just want to just kind of point that out. Okay, so thank you. Um, in terms of reopening the office, again, we would work with the HR consultant to make sure you're bringing back people in proper order, considering all concerns, handling it, communicating it properly. And then also having a COVID protocol for the office, a set of rules um, that handle how people are to behave. And then once you do that, uh, you want to make sure that that is enforced. Anything you put in writing, you should do. Um, if you're going to leave your office ahead of the scheduled lease and you want to sublet it, first thing we have to do is review your lease to make sure it's allowed. But if you're on that lease, you still have liability for that space. And so while the nonprofit may no longer be in that space, you are now a landlord. And so we would have to add what's called a lesser risk classification. Um, and then you would also want to create a lease between yourself and the organization that's subletting from you to make sure that just as any tenant would hopefully uh, indemnify, hold harmless and agree to defend the landlord for any actions arising out of use of that space. And then if you're closing your office, you want to uh, discuss that with your insurance agent to eliminate the location, uh, or if you're closing it and just not going to use it, you want to review the vacancy clause um, with your agent because properties left unattended for a certain amount of time lose certain coverages such as broken pipes and vandalism. Uh, so we want to be well aware of those issues. And then crime, as we talked about, if you don't have it, um, I would suggest a nonprofit should have it. And you want to coordinate it with the cyber program because both cyber and crime can cover the same 
um, type of loss. And we wanna make sure that you don't carry that coverage twice. And then in terms of, this is my last slide, in terms of informational resources, one of the things you can do is ask your insurance broker to invite you to carrier and or law firm webinars. We, are, we get inundated, it's not so much anymore, but in the beginning, we get inundated with training sessions. And uh, if you ask, you can be um, put on the distribution list so you can attend these trainings. Uh, and then this is a live, I don't know if people are gonna get this, this is a live link to the Attorney General's board members of charitable organization guidelines. And, um, and it's something that every uh, non-compensated board member should be given every year. Um, so thank you for your patience. I understand this is pretty dry material, but it is in the interest of the financial well-being of your organization. And if done right, can make the difference between having a good reputation and surviving and going on and continue your operation or, um, or not. So uh, very often the money you're spending um, can be allocated in better ways. Um, and if you don't have coverage, at least if you know you don't have coverage, um, then you can handle it with kit gloves and, uh, and hopefully be on your way to a more secure uh, program that you have confidence in. So thank you very much. It was very nice to be able to present to you. Thanks, Chris. Really appreciate it. Um, and Melissa's with the law firm of Nutter, and Nutter's been one of our partners for, I think, over 20 years at the Volunteer Lawyers of the Art, so we appreciate all their support. Chris, can you go down two more slides to Melissa's? One more? There you go. Perfect. Um, so, Melissa, thank you, and for all your support over the years as well. Oh, sure, and, and thank you, Chris. I just want to say um, sometimes you don't look at the insurance issue holistically in the whole universe at one time, and I just find that that the materials you put together to be a great resource um, to take the holistic view, um, especially when an organization doesn't have a, um, one dedicated um, risk management officer. So thank you. Um, I, I think this is a great service to the whole community. Um, and the, the, the Mass General's board um, got guide for board members of charitable organizations. Chris mentioned that both he and I recommended it. Um, so it's a perfect segue. Um, and I think maybe one of the reasons why we both felt in, um, motivated to put it up is because I find it so user-friendly. Um, it's, it's very readable, it's very um, digestible, and it's something that um, we also recommend people distribute annually. And um, while, while we're on that topic, um, if you don't have an, a a board member onboarding program set up. Um, this is a very, very um, good piece of material um, to include in a board member onboarding um, packet of materials or for a training. So um, that's a great segue. One of the things that I just thought would be good to um, dovetail off of with Chris's um, Presentation is one of the questions I get, mostly from smaller organizations, um, is, well, aren't there protections um, for nonprofit organizations and for individuals involved in nonprofits in the law or elsewhere? And so, so why would I need insurance? Um, and I just wanted to just run through those just so people know that they're there, but but also more importantly, so people know what's not there and, and what doesn't get protected and why um, they're, they're by no means a substitute um, to, to, a, to a, um, a healthy insurance plan. Um, so you've got in Massachusetts, I think the only state left that has a cap on tort liability for nonprofits. Um, but there are limitations on that. It has to be something done in furtherance of your charitable activity. It's again, only for torts and just generally speaking, those will be negligence claims. Um, and so it's something that if you were going to use that as a, a defense on your amount of your liability is likely to, to be challenged and has some, some pitfalls there, um, but that is there. Um, there are also state and federal protections for volunteers. Again, uh, non-paid volunteers 
who have to prove that they were acting in furtherance of the charitable organization's mission does not cover auto policy, auto incidences um, and also you know does not cover gross negligence situations um, and neither of these um, protections in the law cover um, legal fees. So what we were talking about before the presentation is um, it, it's one thing to, to be right or to not be in violation of what you're being accused of violating. It's another thing to have to go through the time and the money and the process to prove it. Um, and so that, that's one of the things um, you know, that even though you're, you may be on the right side of the law, you have no, the law provides no um, financial um, protection for you. Um, and then uh, lastly, um, Chris has mentioned this as well, most corporations will provide indemnifications in their governing documents for officers, directors, cert sometimes certain key employees or agents, um, but again, there's also a process. There needs to be um, certain elements proven and that protection is only as good as the assets of the organization at, at a maximum. So I just wanted to, in case there was any confusion out there on that front, um, just walk through those pieces. I've put some um, on the next slide, I've put some resources. Again, we've already mentioned the, the board members guide and, and in that guide, it goes through the, the, the fiduciary duties that a board member owes the organization, the duty of loyalty and the do, duty to um, make reasonable, judge, make good faith business judgments. Um, there's also things in there about having good policies about um, director, uh, officer compensation um, and, and conflicts of interest policies, all of which um, is, is great reading. I put also, um, we talked a lot about the remote work environment. That is of course a hot topic right now. Um, Massachusetts, New Hampshire suing Massachusetts about this issue at the moment. Um, so I think we're gonna see this play out, but I have highlighted um, the Department of Revenue's current guidance on what to do with a, a, a worker who is now remote, who lives out of state, who once um, was coming into Massachusetts and, and um, being uh, ha having income tax withheld from their salary due to um, working in Massachusetts. Um, and, and, and the general rule is if you're not in Massachusetts, if you're home in another state, because of the pandemic, um, they're still considering um, it mass source income. And I put the prop charitable property tax exemption piece here, just to flag that if you are considering um, lease, sub leasing pro property that you own, you just wanna make sure um, that you're doing it in a way that doesn't cause you to have unrelated business income tax. So you need to do um, make your lease terms on fixed, a fixed lease amount, not based on any kind of revenue or profits. Um, and also if you own the real estate and you're, you're leasing it out as opposed to a sublet situation, just make sure that um, if you have a charitable real estate tax exemption um, that you're not doing anything to put that in jeopardy. Um, so those were the highlights that I wanted to, um, to touch upon after, after Chris's excellent presentation. Thanks, Melissa. Chris, you can go down one slide. Uh, Luke included uh, his kind of just info. This will be part of the deck that everyone gets just to remember that uh, obviously the VLA is a service and that it's part of this whole partnership with the Mass Cultural Council. So if there are ongoing legal issues, obviously that program is there to support that. Um, and Chris, can you go back just a couple slides? There are two left conversations since we have just a few minutes and we do have one question also I wanna to pose to Melissa as well. So go back up, one more. So this slide is just uh, on the idea that on the, on the list that we put on the beginning, we did have a slide on collaborations. Um, so this will be covered more, uh, more directly in one of Luke's follow-up workshops. We could do three hours just on collaborations, but we wanted to highlight the idea that 
kind of post COVID and part of the recovery groups might be collaborating, they might be sharing space, they might be doing joint performances, they might be doing jo joint productions, and we appreciate that. It, it is just something where just to be, not that people don't know this already, to be sensitive to, there might be additional agreements that need to be put in place, there's liability, there's insurance questions, there's ownership questions around um, potential intellectual property, there's power disparities between collaborators often and how that plays out, it goes back again to kind of values and culture and equity. Um, and then communication. So we just, we didn't want to like skip it because it is an important part. I do think of the recovery as groups have broken down barriers and are doing more work together than maybe they had in the past. Um, and then the next slide, Chris. Same thing with this idea of mergers, acquisitions and, and or dissolutions, if you want to add that to the list. So similar type piece, this is something that Melissa does in her practice um, and the Arts and Business Council has done, you know, for others. This is, I think, going to be an evolving conversation over the next really probably one to five years, we probably will see some increased activity in this space. So if you're an executive or you're part of the board and you're having these conversations, um, we appreciate that that is a much more in-depth uh, conversation that does have governing uh, elements, finance, insurance, strategic planning, implementation, human resources, legal compliance. It's really kind of a, a souped up uh, collaboration in many ways with, with extra uh, complexities um, you know, as well. So we didn't want to skip those, although we do recognize they're much uh, deeper conversations. Uh, Melissa, there is one question still left in the Q&A, uh, and it's, it's a question regarding, regarding waivers that Chris had mentioned the idea of a waiver. Um, and so the question is, does the waiver prevent the volunteer from making a claim on the nonprofit? That's the question that was posed, I think, more directly in response to the idea of, um, of waivers in the past part of the conversation. Um, I, I didn't, I appreciate Chris's take on this as well, but um, similar to um, what I said before, you can't prevent anyone from making a claim against you. I mean, that you, you can't control what other people are gonna do. So, I, so the answer to the question is no. Um, you know, I, th I think the organization is in a better position to defend itself. Um, if it has a strong program of, of informing volunteers or, or, or participants of, of certain risks and in, in, um, in, in, in having a waiver process. Okay. All right, so we have, we're trying to be respectful. Mike, how we did pretty good. I mean, it's, it's 229 yeah. and we finished every slide on the deck. So I just wanna appreciate and thank uh, Melissa and, and Chris for for their time and their expertise and their openness to you know support individual artists and arts organizations in their practice and and so and to Luke for all the work he does with the volunteer lawyers for the arts and his follow up with all his presentations so you know on that I think we've answered every question so far I don't think there's anything left I was just going to say I feel like we've got some stage managers in the crowd here today we were right on time and finished it all without going <laughs> uh, paying for overtime so I <laughs> exactly <laughs> I no we're union here we know we yeah exactly. Um, all right. So thank you all for attending our, our workshop. I know an hour and a half getting through liability and insurance and some of these uh, topics um, are, are for some folks a challenge and some folks just nerd out about it. So um, thank you for coming on. I will say that uh, this is obviously uh, recorded and as soon as it's uh, uh, downloaded and then uploaded to our YouTube channel, um, you'll get a note from me when that's available and also um, this uh, presentation so you can get some of the links. Um, and if you wanted to register for any of our additional thank you for Kaylin for putting all of the links and the registration materials all in the chat. Those are all available to any cultural nonprofit. So um, if you want to share this with other places that you volunteer or other organizations that you want to, to know some of this topic, they're free and they're open to anybody. So there's no there's no cost and there's no barrier for entry there. Um, thank you all for being part of our, our presentation and giving some uh, uh, much needed uh, conversation on this topic. And we'll see you again at the very next Mass Cultural Council webinar. Have a great day. All right, Michael, there's one more question in the, in the Q&A just came in. Oh, just popped Is in. Chris open? So this is more of a question to you, Chris. Are you open if people want to contact you about yeah. nonprofit insurance questions? Um, just please let folks know if they can reach out to you. Of course. If, if somebody has a question or wants help with their program, um, that is um, to a great degree what we do. Okay, great. Well, thank you for that. Okay. Um, Thanks so I much. Think that's good.
I think we're good. Thanks everybody. And really appreciate uh, you coming today and, and also the, all the work that you do. Have a great rest of the day, everyone. You too. Bye. Thank you.